So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Doesn't matter where you are in, in the world. So thank you all for joining us today for a next uh, cast talk. And uh, today we have the pleasure to have here Professor Marcelino Santos. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And uh, Professor Sandu Pereira from Unicinos, uh, in the city of São Leopoldo, South Brazil, will be the session chair today for this very interesting subject that will be presented by Professor Marcelino. And then I give the floor here to Sandro. As you, but before that, just a reminder, as you know, you can do your questions anytime during the talk. They will be read, the first question will be read first, and then Sandro will read the questions to Professor Marcelino at the end of his talk. So uh, I give the floor now to, to Sandro. So thank you for accept sharing the session today. So Sandro, the floor is with you. And uh, again, thank you to Marcelino for accepting to give uh, this uh, talk about this very interesting subject directly from Lisbon. Sandro? OK. Well, uh... I'm very happy to, to, to be here to present uh, Professor Marcelino Santos, uh, who is uh, actually an authority on power management unities uh, for IoT. So it's a very, very hot topic nowadays. And uh, Professor Marcelino uh, received the, the master and PhD degrees in electric and computer engineer from Instituto Superior Tecnico, Technical University of Lisbon. And uh, he teaches microelectronics uh, there, and he's currently coordinator of the scientific area of electronics. Besides several uh, PhD uh, students, uh, master theses, uh, several papers, uh, he he's also uh, co-founder of Silicon Gate uh, LDA, and he's CTO of the company. Uh, we which is today uh, one of the world leading companies in power management IP. So that's why we, we, we should see this talk. Uh, we are really happy to have you here, Professor Marcelinos. Please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I thank um, Ricardo for his kind invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in this very uh, good initiative. And I, I thank you, Sandro, for your kind introduction. Well, um, yes, uh, let's talk a little bit about power management units. Um, uh, as you know, for systems on chips, um, we have different, different cores. And of course, one of the very mandatory core in, uh, in a system on chip is a power management unit. And I will show you. Um, a little bit of detail on how, um, what is the architecture, what are the, the blocks that are the building blocks of the power management unit, and how uh, was the evolution in the recent years uh, up to the IoT uh, PMUs that we have now. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, we will go first through some basics on uh, of what a power management unit includes. Um, and then we will go for, uh, let's say, a, a little more complex and with more configurable power management unit. And finally, we will go for the IoT power management unit. So, uh, you will expect for sure that power management units include voltage regulators of course um, the question is that we have uh, supplying voltage and we want to be able to, to supply different voltage domains and so we probably will need not one but several voltage regulators uh, that's the most common scenario we need to decide for each voltage domain which is the more appropriate regulator type. If it's a linear regulator or if it's a switched regulator, 
usually that decision is made based on two criteria, which is efficiency, of course, and noise. Th those are the two main criteria for deciding if we choose um, a switching uh, regulator or a linear one. Of course, that linear regulators can uh, provide um, uh, an output voltage without ripple, and uh, they don't cause also any type of noise at the input, uh, at the supply voltage of the, of the power management unit, while switching regulators always uh, produce some noise, uh, some ripple at the output, and also some noise at the input that will propagate to other blocks. And um, since they can uh, not reject com completely the noise from their supply. Uh, this means that a trade-off exists between noise, as I explained, and efficiency. Um, this type of um, decision regarding the architecture of the power management unit, um, sometimes it's very easy to make the decision. For instance, if I'm going to supply a, a digital core Usually, a digital core requires a low, very low voltage, and it means that there is a huge difference in voltage between the, the core voltage and the supply of the power management unit. And when we have a large difference in voltage, it means that if we use a linear regulator, we will have a poor um, efficiency, since the efficiency of the linear regulator is directly the output voltage divided by the input voltage since the current will be the same, it's a, a series regulator. Um, so when we have a large voltage drop, we usually tend to go for um, most efficient solutions like a buck um, regulator. And then we can, if we have this voltage for, for instance, a, a digital core, if we need an analog voltage that is lower than that, uh, regulated voltage, we can regulate it using a low dropout regulator that has um, an acceptable efficiency if the drop is not so high. So that's why we uh, use prefer low dropout. Um, even if we need, um, for instance, for a, a digital core, noise won't be a problem or some ripple won't be a problem. But if there is a, a sensitive core that will be supplied by a, a voltage domain, uh, we have and we use um, several times the solution of making a cascade between a DC-DC converter, a switch DC-DC converter and the linear regulator, where most of the voltage drop will occur in the DC-DC and, and the LDO will act more like a filter that will provide a clean, ripple-free output uh, voltage well but this is just a let's say an introduction on the decision of the architecture in many cases the customer or let's say the target application already has in mind uh, for each do supply domain if it's a switch uh, converter or if it's a linear converter that will be uh, used um, so th that is not usually the, the big deal what I want you to, 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 pre to present with this power management unit basics are some concepts with some signals that I have here that, let's say that I have selected the ones that are mandatory. You see here the APC. APC, it's, uh, let's say, in-house, in, in Silicon Gate, at Silicon Gate, what we call the advanced power controller. But this is present in all power management units since all power management units need to have some block to provide the voltage reference for all the, the, the regulators. By the way, I'm representing here that the voltage reference has a single arrow, but in reality we have output filters and individual voltage reference for each regulator so that noise on one regulator will not impact the, the VREF on a different regulator. So we have individual uh, low-pass filters for each VREF. And also the current bias for all the regulators, all of them will need some current, some constant current to operate. And this current is provided by the advanced power controller. 
and the name controller somehow um, let us um, think that it's not a dummy block that just provides uh, currents and, volt and reference voltage. It, it has some control capability. And by saying that, I mean that it controls, actually controls the, at least the power up sequence when I represent here the enable one up to N. Uh, it means the enable signals for all the voltage regulators. There is a, a power up sequence that must be ensured for the system to, to start up properly. And uh, one of the reasons for that is, uh, well, there are several reasons for defining a power up sequence, a proper power up sequence. But if we look at the, the battery perspective, it's a system powered by a battery. If all the DC, DC or all the, the regulators start at the same time, we would have uh, large capacitors, out, out, uh, output capacitors uh, at the outside of the chip being charged, all of them uh, simultaneously. And that could be, um, that could represent a very large current uh, coming from the supply. And this could um, have impact on battery life. So by ensuring uh, that we have a power up sequence, we are providing current in a predefined order that we know that will um, be that the system will be able to power up in a way that for instance when the, the processor reset is released we already have the retention memory supplied we already have um, other blocks that are required supply so here is how, how it goes so uh, the first regulator will receive the enable signal all regulators besides the, the, the voltage reference, the current biasing and the enable signal, they have a power good indicator. So the, each regulator has a comparator of the output voltage with the program value. And when it reaches 95% um, of the program value, it will trigger power good. And it means that the APC can continue with the power up sequence, uh, enabling the, the following uh, regulator, waiting for its power good indication, and then enabling the, 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 the one that follows, and so on, up to the uh, final regulator gives the power good indication. And when that happens, it means that we finished our power up sequence from the regulator's point of view, and we can do uh, two things. We can release the digital uh, reset, um, the, the reset for the digital logic that I'm representing here for power on reset inverted. Uh, the Z here represents an inverted signal. So for Z will be released, it will go up, it will go to one, meaning that the digital logic will no longer be in reset because the supply is okay. And we can do another thing, which is we can release the isolation of the digital signals because up to the moment um, that we finish the reset of the logic all the digital um, bits uh, were in default value or undefined so it means that all blocks including the blocks inside the power management unit that have digital inputs for instance all regulators they have a five bits for programming the output voltage. These five digital bits that program the output voltage, they were in isolation with the level converters disabled. So this signal means disable level converters. Level converters are required to make the conversion between the digital uh, voltage level and the internal supply voltage level. But those level converters, they have a default that is assumed when we are in isolation because this LVL is one. So it means that uh, during the whole ramp up, all the power up sequence, all the digital interface of the, the regulators and all, all the, even the APC has uh, some digital signals. We, I will explain what are those signals in a minute. In a minute, but all those signals they are assumed uh, mm, as default. Uh, the default values are assumed because the isolation, this this LVL, this isolation, this disable of the level shifters, 
is used to isolate all the digital signals that uh, we cannot trust them while the digital logic is in reset or uh, with a supply that is ramping up. So the power management unit is able to power up with default values, with the digital default values at all inputs, all digital inputs, and only after the ramp up of all the regulators of the power up sequence, we release the reset and we release the interface, the digital interface, we release the isolation of the digital. So let's look at the, the APC, what, what are the main functions that it, it performs, and as you uh, as I already mentioned, it, it provides the reference voltage um, for all uh, the regulators, and not only for the regulators, as, as we will see uh, in a few uh, minutes, or other blocks of the power management that did reference voltages, like ADCs. Uh, it is the APC that provides those um, reference voltages, and they are decoupled one from the others. Um, the, it also provides bias currents, of course. These bias currents can uh, they come all from PMOS current meter, and they will be uh, let's say those branches of bias currents that they, they can be open if regulators are disabled, uh, as we will see in the next versions of the power management unit. The APC generates the power on reset, the power Z, as I mentioned. It controls the power up sequence, of course. It, it detects under voltage. The under voltage, the under voltage lockout is a, a situation when the supply voltage goes below a certain voltage that we cannot guarantee the correct operation of the power management unit. It is the APC that is responsible for monitoring the input voltage and detect that the power management unit is in under voltage condition. And uh, in that case, all regulators will be disabled and uh, only when the under voltage condition is uh, exit then we are able to to start up the the, the power uh, the next power up sequence more functions that the apc can perform uh, i was mentioning that the apc includes digital ports that are isolated by the diesel vl signal while the logic is not fully operational and these digital Port of the APC is uh, has different pins. Among them, we have the trimming bits for making the reference voltage um, more independent on temperature, make the compensation on temperature and make the compensation on process. So we have bits for trimming uh, the VREF uh, in terms of temperature uh, and also for trimming the bias currents for trimming the, the, the oscillator uh, when, uh, when, the, when the, the PMU includes switch converters, it is the responsibility of the APC to, to, to generate the clock for the buck converters or for charge pumps. And in that case, um, the, the, the clock that is um, provided by the APC can be trimmed in frequency using also these digital pins that we have available on the APC. Those pins can come from a one-time programming memory or can, they can come also from the processor somehow. Um, the APC controls the isolation, as I mentioned, through the diesel VL uh, input that is used not only inside the, the power management unit, but can be used also outside for other blocks. It regulates also the voltage for other PMU uh, low power cores. Uh, I, I didn't mention that, but the APC, these, uh, all these blocks, they need some analog, clean analog supply lower than the, the, the V-in, and the APC also regulates and provides that Let's say AVDD for all these all these blocks. Uh, cascode protection voltages. It's very important when when the the supply voltage that we have in our power management unit, the V in, is higher than the voltage that each individual device, each individual transistor can support. Then we need cascode voltage for protecting the NMOS um, 
transistors and PMOS transistors, and those VCAS and VCAS P, those CAS code voltages are also provided by the APC. And also, it can include brownout detection. It can, it can um, detect that the supply voltage is uh, being reduced below a certain value for some cases. Uh, continue, continue, continuing our analysis of, of this basic PMU, we can look at the also linear regulators. And uh, in this case, the low dropout regulators, we call them low dropout because the difference of voltage between the input and output can be very reduced. We need to, to design these uh, low dropout regulators with PMOS um, uh, series transistors because only in, in that way we can ensure that we are able to have a very low um, dropout between input and output uh, without having to increase the voltage inside the regulator. Uh, the, load, the LDO provides, of, of course, a constant and clean uh, ripple output voltage. Uh, well, clean of ripple mm, uh, and much more, let's say that it's much more clean of ripple than, than the, um, the voltage that we get from a DC-DC. Of course, it, it has a large ripple for sure. When I say that it's clean for ripple and I smile, it's because the noise, if I have a, a, a switching DC-DC, a switching regulator in my system supplied by the same supply voltage, of course, that each time I have a large current flowing here, since my input voltage uh, is not provided by a, a zero ohm uh, impedance um, voltage supply, I mean that the the voltage supply that provides the VI, it has some uh, resistance, some impedance. It means that each time I uh, uh, need current, a peak of current on the DC-DC, it will cause a drop of voltage in the supply. And that level of noise will somehow propagate to the output because the power supply rejection ratio, so the, the, the capability of the linear regulator to reject noise is not uh, infinite so we will have some um, rejection of course uh, it is designed to have a good power supply rejection ratio but somehow some noise will pass so, um, so sorry uh, as i mentioned the output of all regulators not only ldos is always programmable this is uh, let's say mandatory because uh, if we design regulators for the target voltages that customers um, specify, when the specification changes during the design phase, it would be a headache. And uh, by have, it's very easy to make programmable voltage by having a resistive divider that we can control with a binary word, and therefore we get um, we get a, a, a regulator that is much more flexible. It can be used for dynamic voltage scaling. It can be used for different, um, can be reused uh, for uh, in the, in, when it's designed in a certain technology node, it can be reused in different projects uh, and it will be more um, flexible if it's programmable, of course. So we, it, it represents also more reusability. Includes a power down mode, uh, meaning that it has an enable signal that I have already, already mentioned that allow us to, to control the power up sequence. So it means that we have an um, enable signal that when it's zero, we have a power down, we have the regulator in power down mode. I already mentioned also the power good output. It's a digital output um, that goes out of the linear regular of the linear regulator, in, informing the APC that we reach the 95%. By the way, it has some hysteresis because if it didn't include hysteresis, what could happen? Uh, you can imagine if I receive the power good from a certain LDO saying, "Okay, I am above 95%." So as I receive these, I start, I enable the next regulator. And what will happen when I enab enable the next regulator immediately is that this uh, regulator starts providing current to the output capacitor that comes from this input. 
and it means since we have a limited impedance here, the impedance, impedance at the input is not zero, it means that the voltage will drop when I enable the regulator. And if I do this enabling exactly at the moment that the previous one achieved 95%, I will lose regulation on this and the power good of the previous regulator would drop and I would be in an oscillation in an oscillator in a in an unstable power up condition where I lose power good because I start the input voltage dropped because I started the next regulator and uh, so uh, I stop this, uh, I disable this one, and I enable that one, I achieve power good again, and then I start to enable the next one, and I will lose the regulation again, and this can have some excitations before finally being able to power up. So to avoid that, power good indication indicators from each individual regulator need to have hysteresis. So it, it is goes to one when we achieve 95% of the programmed value, in this case it's the default value because we have the interface, digital interface blocked by this LDL. And, and then it only loses power good information if it goes below 90% of the output um, programmed voltage. Uh, the, 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 each regulator, each linear regulator receives from the APC the biasing current, of course, the reference voltage and the enable control signal, of course, and it provides to the APC the power good indication. Okay. Now, if we look at um, a switched, um, switched voltage uh, regulator and the most common use, we, of course, we can design boosts and we can design but boosts, but the most common uh, DCDC that we have uh, switch DC DC is the buck because most of the systems are powered by lithium ion batteries that when fully charged can have more than four volts when fully discharged have um, less than three volts and most of the digital logic is supplied by less than one volt so we need um, bucks to reduce the this gap between the battery supply and the, the, the voltage that the cores require. So these DCDCs, they of course they provide a almost constant output voltage, which is a, a our program voltage plus some ripple. Uh, they allow uh, output voltage to be programmable once again. Um, include a power down, of course, when they are disabled, they, they have an enable pin so that you, you can control their enable. Um, condition in the power-up sequence. In, in this PMU, it's only for the power-up sequence. We will see that for more complex power management units, we will have them in power down even when we can have them uh, in power down even when the, the system is in high power. Uh, the DCDC can provide, a, of course, a power good output. Once again, with this resist, 95% for the power to go to 01 and 90 to go to zero. And it receives from the APC exactly the same thing, biasing current, reference voltage, the enable control signal, but now we need a clock. So it means that all power management units that include a, a buck DCDC or a switch DCDC, they need to have the APC, will need to, to include some oscillator so that it can provide um, a clock signal for clocking the this, this, this type of um, uh, regulators. Now that we have seen the basics of the, let's say, primary power management units, something that all power management units must include, I would say, we can look at some more sophisticated power management units let, for system on chip. Let's say that uh, these are more complete power management units that allow already different operating modes. So the, I would say that the main new new key in town here is the RTC, uh, the real-time clock. And this real-time clock, so you, you already are familiar with the APC, the advanced power controller that provides, as you know, the reference voltage and biasing currents for all linear regulators and DCDC. But we have now three new blocks here, which is an oscillator, an ADC, for instance, and, and the real-time clock. 
And this real-time clock, it's the one that I think it's novelty um, and more important because it will introduce, it will introduce the capability of having uh, two operating modes. And I will explain because we have an alarm here that comes from the real-time clock. What, what, what is the real-time clock? Uh, real-time clock, what the, the words mean that we have a clock for timekeeping. Uh, in reality, we have like a 32 bits or 64 bits in some cases. We also have 48 bits, uh, 32 plus 16 bits for timekeeping that gives, uh, uh, we are counting seconds in this timekeeping. So it, with those number of bits, we, we are able to count time for many years. And um, with a crystal oscillator, typically it's a 32 kilohertz crystal oscillator, uh, Pierce oscillator, uh, with very with ultra low power, and it's a 32 kilohertz because 32 kilohertz divided by um, 15 15 um, uh, two up to 15, meaning that we are dividing. Dividing the this frequency of 32 kilohertz by uh, uh, counter with 15 bits, uh, we are able to produce uh, one second, and it is this second that is ticking and incrementing time in our timekeeping uh, register, which I mentioned that it has typically 32 bits, but can have 48, for instance, and uh, that's, I would say, the very basic um, purpose of the real-time uh, clock. The real-time clock has this uh, crystal oscillator of 32 kilohertz, the division in a divider of 15 bits to obtain the one second tick. And this one second tick increments the 32 bit counter so that we keep track of time. But since we keep track of time, we can also have some register where we can store a predefined value to wake up the system. So we can, for instance, do data logging uh, in a way, a very effective way where we have the system asleep uh, with only the real-time clock working. And uh, from time to time, so we will issue an alarm signal and we wake up the complete power management unit to perform some uh, measurements, and then it can also uh, store data and do the data logging, or it can also um, power some RF domain that will transmit data that was captured uh, by the ADC. So by the what this means is with the real-time clock, we have the capability of having two completely different power modes. One, where our... Uh, system on chip can have a ultra low power in the range of hundreds of nanoamps lower than uh, in, the, in this order of magnitude that's what the pierce oscillator uh, plus the, the tick of one second and timekeeping needs to operate and when the timekeeping register equals the value that was programmed in the alarm then the apc is enabled and it starts the power-up sequence that I've mentioned before in the basic power management unit. And we have a full power-up of the system. The digital processor will know what to do. It can enable an ADC, it can do whatever it wants. And through the serial interface, it will program the alarm to um, the next wake-up moment. And it will also order the RTC to disable the APC so that this uh, alarm signal is resetted and everything goes back to power down. So when alarm is set, everything is in high power. When alarm is reset, we go back to only the RTC enabled with its ultra low power. And it is the, that's the reason why I mentioned that this, uh, let's say, improved power management unit for system on chip has his main um, uh, differenti differentiating point in the RTC. It is the RTC that allows us to count time so that we can periodically 
wake the system and do things. Uh, we can now look with more detail to what the RTC does. It includes, as I mentioned, um, a crystal oscillator that has exactly uh, a frequency that divided by 15 uh, counter with 15 bits will tick um, one second uh, with a period of one second so that it can increment the timekeeping register. It will, as I mentioned, activate the alarm output if the uh, time is identical to the alarm. And uh, of course, it includes a, a digital interface that can, can be serial. In some cases, it can also be parallel interface with a processor. It is here, it is assumed that we have some processor already because without a processor, we wouldn't be able to uh, reprogram the clock, to reprogram the alarm, and to know what to do when the system wakes up due to the alarm. So it's, I would say, mandatory to have some processing unit to program the alarm from time to time uh, with the cu current time plus delta and also to to know what activities to perform when the system is wake the system wakes up um, if time keeping is really important uh, in terms of accuracy then uh, it's also possible to trim to trim the the, the the frequency and this can be trimmed in different ways. One way of doing the trimming is by changing the parasitic capacitance at the pads of the crystal. This is one way of doing the, tri the trimming and this is usually done in a closed loop when we measure the temperature uh, and so that we can uh, reduce the dependency of the frequency uh, of the crystal on temperature. Let's say that uh, this uh, uh, frequency can change like 300 parts per million if we don't do any type of compensation. So 300 parts per million, it's what a crystal uh, changes in frequency if we go from minus 40 to 125 degrees. But we can reduce that dependency, uh, that variation, by um, monitoring the temperature and changing the capacitance, um, we can have a digital word that trims the capacitance on the pads of the, the crystal that's to reduce that. That's one option, uh, the closed loop. That's na the name of that solution is a temperature compensated crystal oscillator, the TX, um, XO, sorry, TCXO, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And uh, another solution is a much easier solution, uh, let's say, but not so good because it's not so closed loop, is just to uh, adjust the number of ticking that is um, the number of clock cycles that are required to count one second, uh, but we don't do it in uh, each second. We can we do that normally each two seconds. So it means that, uh, sorry, it, we do that it, each 64 seconds. Uh, each 64 seconds, there is one second that can have more or less 30 uh, microns, uh, slots of 30 microns, which is microseconds, which is um, the period of this clock. So that's how we can go as down as 0 0.5 parts per million uh, in accuracy. But once again, this is not uh, in closed loop. In closed loop, we need to measure the temperature. OK, so the real-time clock uses ultra low power. You already noticed that I, I've put some figures on when presenting the two possible power configurations, uh, the, the real-time clock when, um, when only counting time, uh, when time, doing timekeeping, it only requires 100 nanoseconds. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the alarm output will enable the high power mode, of course. Um, this I already explained that the power management unit is enabled when uh, the alarm is one, and then it, um, when the digital finishes its activities, it resets the alarm and everything goes back to, to low power. And we also, uh, the, here the RTC, the real-time clock, uh, as you can imagine, it's the only block that is always being supplied. 
And since it is the block that is always being supplied, it's the, the block that uh, is used also for general purpose registers when we want to store information that we want to be able to retrieve when the system wakes up again, then we must store that information in uh, the RTC because that's where the registers will be keep being supplied even if the complete power management unit is in low power. Uh, we also have solutions where we, instead of using the crystal oscillator, use an R internal RC oscillator of 32 kilohertz for the same purpose. And we also, this avoids the use of external crystal oscillator, uh, external crystal. And we also have the possibility of including both the crystal oscillator and the RC oscillator, where the RC oscillator has the purpose of monitoring the crystal one. So that if the crystal oscillator changes the frequency too much regarding the RC oscillator, we can assume that um, someone is trying to tamper with the frequency, which we will detect and we can act and disable the, the, the system. So it's an anti-tampering solution. Okay. Here you have some numbers on the dependence of the current consumption of the real-time clock um, as the temperature changes. Okay, we have other blocks that can uh, be part of this power management unit for SOC. The ADC, for instance, it can be used to, to measure temperatures using diets. Can, those can be internal or external. They, this um, ADC can also be used to measure voltages in different vo the different voltage domains. It can also measure currents of the regulators that the regulators are providing. Uh, by, for instance, we can measure the current on a LDO by mirroring the output current of the LDO and um, um, by making it go through a, a resistor. By changing the resistor value, it's like we have different scales for measuring the current. Um, of course, that ADC can multiplex between different input sources. So with a single ADC, we can... Uh, measure temperature, voltages, and currents uh, with just a, a digital word selecting the input source. Uh, of course, we'd have some uh, end of conversion and start of conversion protocol that will allow the, the interface with the digital. Um, the it, APC receives also a reference voltage and bias current. Of course, it will uh, need a clock for operating. It's a sigma delta. The one that we use is a sigma delta converter, it has a start of conversion and issues and end of conversion. Oscillator clock, it's something that we can also have for clocking the digital processor. I don't go into many details. We have different options. It, it can, can um, uh, we can program the, the frequency um, based as a multiple of the crystal frequency or, or not. The, both three options are open. Uh, accuracy and uh, we have a lock uh, output saying that the frequency is okay. Uh, uh, this is, I won't go into that. Let's go to the most interesting part of the presentation, I would, I would say, which is the evolution. You already seen the basic power management unit. You see some evolution when we added the RTC, that, where we were able to select between different power modes. And now you will see what we can do um, by adding some more reconfigurability in the the in our power management unit, so it is frequent to have very tight energy budget because systems can be powered with energy harvesting, or the systems can be very limited in volume, uh, limiting the size of the battery, or they can use a non-replaceable battery, and we want to to extend the life the the time of the system as much as possible. So. Uh, the energy budget is very tight. Uh, it's normal in IoT that systems need to be compliant with different multiple sensors. Uh, so we will need multiple power modes to optimize our uh, energy use. And uh, we need also reset actions and wake actions that cannot be only triggered by a single alarm. Because if we have multiple sensors, we need to be able to wake up our power management unit and our system, ultimately, from different sources, not only the alarm itself. 
So in terms of power configurability, uh, targeting um, much clever use, uh, smart use of the, the, the budget of energy that we have, this means that while we are in high power, instead of having the complete system in high power, we, we can high, have high power, but with some voltage regulators kept disabled. And in low power, when you say low power before, uh, I was referring to a case where only the RTC were, were, was keeping time, for, and that's it. But now, while in low power, we can have some uh, voltage regulators kept active, for instance, for retain, retention memory or other purposes. So, and we need to jo join that with multiple wake, power, power on and reset sources with configurable polar polarity, but with configurable polarities because we want to design as much as possible in a way that uh, the design can be reused by different systems. But of course, masking is mandatory because only uh, with masking, we are able to have wake causes that they are enabled in under certain circumstances, but they can be disabled as well if we want. So um, this power configurability, uh, allowing uh, high power um, with some uh, regulators excluded from the high power, and low power, excluding some regulators from the low power where some regulators are kept active. This information, this configurability, the only way where it can be kept uh, it's, is in the RTC because it's the only domain that is always powered. Uh, <coughs> so wake inputs can be active high or active low can be enabled or disabled. Uh, the system can be sensitive to power on and or reset signals depending on the present power state. And the information to configure these, to configure which wake inputs are enabled or disabled. Where shall I store the information about um, wake inputs that are active high or active low, the polarity of the wake inputs? Uh, in for each situation, each power mode, each power state, um, what are the reset signals that will be able to um, uh, cause a reset in my in my system? This information must be stored in the RDC, in the RTC, because it's the only power domain that is always powered. So what I mean is now in ultra low power mode. Um, if uh, I, ha I have, of course, the, the RTC, um, the RTC with the timekeeping, and now besides uh, the, 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 the alarm that can enable the system because time equals alarm, I, I can have also multiple alarms, and I, I can also have different wake sources that come from different sensors with different polarities. Some of them can be enabled or disabled, and they will be the source for going from uh, low ultra low power mode to what I'm calling here low power mode, where I'm enabling uh, enabling the APC, and uh, I'm enabling regulators one and two. I'm enabling two regulators. So I'm uh, here. I'm in uh, in a mode where alarm is not one, meaning I'm not in high power. I'm in low power. But even in low power, I'm able to keep some regulators enabled. So this is a situation of ultra low power, only timekeeping and sensitive to events. But I can also be in similar to ultra low power, but now with APC working. And the APC is providing the reference voltage, the bias currents. If I don't have a DC DC enabled, then the APC will not need to turn on the oscillator. I don't need, need to turn on the oscillator. I will only provide the reference voltage and the and the reference and the bias currents. Because I have here a register where I have enabled those two regulators. 
But I have also the other situation where I can have the full power mode where everything is enabled, and that's normal because I receive, imagine that I receive the wake input, it will enable the complete system and everything is in full power. But then the digital processor itself can go and uh, use a disable uh, option of disabling some regulator that will be excluded from the high power. So it's an high power mode, but it's partial because I have disabled some of the regulators uh, because I have that capability in the in in my power management unit. So this is a power management power management unit much more configurable because we don't have only the we don't have only the, the, the low power, ultra low power mode where we have only the time keeping uh, power consumption and the versus the full power version. We have uh, also everything in the middle that we can use. And since we can be waked by different causes, by different wake sources, we need some cause register to to work as a memory to tell the processor when the processor uh, is powered up what was the cause that waked the processor or what was the cause that uh, reset the, the, the system, for instance. So we need to keep track of the events that are configurable. They are multiple events, multiple resets, multiple causes, multiple wake up causes. So we need to be able to to track the history so that the processor is able to, to know what is the actual state where it is. Of course, we need to, to reduce the, the leakage in ultra low power. <clears throat> so it's also, we now enter a new, um, let's say, um, more, more efficient uh, power management unit where we have power gating inside the the power management unit. So if I don't need the the the, the interface, uh, I can power the interface down. Uh, if I don't need it, uh, all the blocks in the RTC that are not being needed at a certain moment, they can be turned off. They can be powered off. We can use power gating, uh, but of course we need level converters or uh, or isolation for that purpose. I, I'm show, showing you here an example of isolation when I, I'm not using the SPI interface. If I do power gating of the SPI interface, if it's the signals that exit the SPI, uh, I need to mask them. Uh, in this case, if I mask at the destination, I can use an AND gate because I'm forcing a zero in all of them independently of what I have here. But if I'm masking at the source of the digital, which is more common, I need to place here a uh, NOR gate because a NOR2 gate, uh, even when it's not powered, if I have one of the inputs forced to one, I will have a zero well-defined at the output. So this, we need to add some masking uh, in, in the blocks that are power gated in the source or at the destination. Um, also, the APC now becomes configurable in terms of power because, as I mentioned, if I don't need, for instance, any DCDC, I can disable the clock. Or if uh, I'm uh, in low power, then also the, the voltage reference and the bias current, they can uh, have um, low power modes. Uh, that's what I'm referring in this last point. Uh, the, 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 there is a, a possibility that uh, we can have all the regulators, they have a low power, low power mode uh, where their capability of mm, line regulation, meaning uh, if the supply changes, keeping the output constant, or ro load regulation, meaning the, the dependence on output voltage of the load, they will exhibit worse performance in, in, the, in that case if they are in low power mode. But it's not a problem because we only use these low power modes for the regulators when the system is not active. It's only for retention purposes. So we don't expect large transients 
and we can relax in terms of the performance of uh, re regulating the voltage independently of transients since we are ensuring at system level that no transients will occur. Um, that's exactly what I'm sacrificing. Performance is not an issue in this case. <clears throat> and that's uh, what I, I'm referring here. So when we have uh, these regulators can be in low power, in low power mode. And if they are in low power mode, it means that they won't be able to regulate so well. But if they are only supplying retention memory or some uh, voltage that some load that will not change, we don't care if they are excellent regulators or just uh, good enough for the job. Um, <clears throat> We have now uh, uh, targeting the flexible uh, different scenarios. We have reset events that can um, uh, be caused by different, can be triggered by different causes. And uh, we have different registers. We have registers for timekeeping, of course, for alarm. We can have many of them, general purpose registers for storing data. But now we can sort data also in external memory that can be powered by domains that we can use by demand when needed. We have the cause uh, registers where we keep uh, the track, we keep the history of what awake the system, what reset it. We have configuration registers where we can configure what is the, the supply voltage for each regulator when it, it powers up. Where we, where we can also keep the, uh, the, the trimming information for the APC. Remember that I mentioned that the APC need configuring uh, information for compensating for temperature or for compensating for frequency for uh, the, the, the bias current. This can be, those digital bits for APC configuration, they, they can be stored in always powered domain. Uh, and of course, reset events are also led to a low identification of what was the history. Um, now, designing for ultra low power, we have many more topics that we can address. The, starting from digital design, digital design in the RTC, uh, as you know, the RTC is now, let's say, the, the the most important block of the PMU because it's the one that is always powered and it's the one that decides the, the power state of the power management unit. Uh, this logic must be asynchronous because if we want to have uh, currents uh, in the range of nanoamps, hundreds of nanoamps, when the system is in low power, we cannot afford a clock always toggling. So uh, logic in the RTC, is asynchronous. Subthreshold is used in all analog design in the RTC. Uh, we don't design with minimum channel length because of the leakage. And uh, also, the non continuous operation is very important. So, for instance, the under voltage condition, we, we let's say we take advantage of the fact that most relevant signals that we want to monitor, they have large capacitors. So if the input voltage comes from a supply that doesn't change uh, immediately, discharge, the battery discharges slowly. So we don't need to be continuously monitoring the battery. The battery voltage is not different from it, the, the value it has. It's not so different from what it was one microsecond ago. So we, we can have a low power clock uh, and this low power clock uh, is a clock that is a normal clock that with a period that we can configure and that will enable many comparators in the system that will be operating in a periodic um, in a periodic way they they we will monitor the input voltage to decide if we are in under voltage periodically we will not monitor it constantly and as these under voltage condition, many other conditions in the system can be monitored 
um, periodically. Even I can now present you one of the new, new, um, uh, let's say, uh, solutions that we have for ultra ultra low power is what we call the ludicrous mode. Ludicrous mode is the mode where we have a regulator that we disable completely. While the regulator is enabled, but the regulator is enabled in the way that we want the regulator to keep the voltage. But we keep the voltage only by using the external capacitor of the, the, the regulator. And we, in the first, in the first cycle, we measure how long, and we define a stress window for the voltage. And we can, in the first cycle, evaluate how long does it take for the, the small load that, the, the, for instance, a retention memory, how long does the retention memory takes to discharge its capacitor from the maximum value that we decided in the hysteresis window to the minimum value. And after we make this cycle of evaluation, then we the, the regulator regulates back to the maximum voltage and everything is turned off and we wait for, uh, with our eyes closed, let's say with our regulator, with our feedback loop completely disabled, with no power consumption, keeping the voltage just by the output capacitor. So it's like a ludicrous mode. This works very well if if there is no big temperature change or there are no if the retention memory of course it doesn't change its power consumption so it's a very efficient solution um now in terms of validation and i'm getting to the end of the, the presentation in terms of validation of these complex very complex systems we have a significant challenge as you can imagine so of course, that transistor level simulation is, is mandatory for all individual blocks. So linear regulators, DCDCs, APCs, all RTC, everything is, each individual block is simulated at transistor level, of course, we use HSPICE. And uh, a limited number of, of um, use cases can also be simulated at transistor level um, in the complete PMU, but only a very limited number of use case scenarios because to, to simulate a complete PMU at transistor level, it's very time consuming, it's very difficult. We can only, but we need to do it for detect uh, leakage conditions. So it's uh, especially of signals crossing power domains. What we rely really a lot on digital Verilog simulating, uh, simulation because we use the real number modeling. So all power supplies, all voltages, all currents are modeled um, as reals using 64 bits and we create very log models for all our blocks using um, this solution so we can uh, deliver the model of the PMU as a front-end view and it can be validated for integration in the system on chip um, so it's possible I'm showing you here just an, an example of uh, what a very log digital very log simulation of a power management unit can show it can show the ramp up so it, when it it was um, here here is the the VREF voltage that was enabled when the system uh, wakes up and the, then the power up sequence when one regulator achieves 95 percent then it starts the regu starts the the power up of a different regulator you can see the power up slope of different regulators then it was a shutdown by some reason and some of them they have um, the, the voltage goes down and then there is another power up uh, afterwards. And, uh, uh, in terms of, of course, you can tell me that why don't we use mixed level simulation? Well, it needs effort to, to be uh, configured the interfaces. And, so, and we have a flow, as I mentioned, where we uh, model very well in very log all the analog signals that are relevant. So we rely on this solution. It's also possible to perform emulation in FPG, FPGAs. We have some custom, customer, customers that do that. Some custom, um, yes. So finally, I will go to my summary. I think that I have exceeded my time a little bit. I apologize. Um, the main conclusions, in my opinion, when we compare basic power management units versus the ones with, where we already have the RTC and versus the ones that we can design right now with 
with, where everything is configurable. The RTC now it's not used only for timekeeping. It allows different power modes uh, in the PMU. Uh, IoT power management units can be waked or reset by different sources, not a single alarm, and they need to save history, of course. Um, they can be configured into different power modes, so individual regulators can be disabled or enabled in high power or in low power in each power mode. And the RTC is the, let's say, the master of the power management unit state, and it controls everything, and that's where the data is stored. Um, ultra low power design means that we need to uh, do power gating uh, at block level, uh, according to the power management unit state, a synchronous design for the logic, of course, and the large channel length and sub threshold for analog design. And periodic operation is the key for achieving ultra low power consumption. So, with everything that we can do from now and then, we don't do permanently. And finally, uh, so the verification challenge, uh, the extensive verification use case scenarios that are required ex is exhaustive validation of power modes. Of, uh, it, it can be done with the Verilog model using the real number modeling, uh, Verilog models. Individual cores, they are validated at transistor level, but, uh, and the global PMU can only be validated at, at transistor level for a limited number of scenarios. and. Of course, that relies on designer experience. And I thank you all for your interest in my presentation. And of course, I'm more than happy to answer to your to your questions. Thank you very much, Professor Marzalino. Uh, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, I would say a fundamental talk when we are talking about IoT, right? Because uh, uh, PMUs are, are at the basis of, of uh, the working of the circuits, right? Well, uh, we do have some 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 uh, some questions here. So, Professor Vinicius Toledo here asked uh, about uh, power good. Uh, so, does power good also validate the box converter of the PMU, or only the LEDs and digital outputs? Yes, the, all all regulators they need to have a power good um, indication so that we know because DC DC converters the, we they can be in the middle of the power up sequence. So when we enable the, the DC DC, we need to that's normal to have several DC DC converters in the system. So when we enable one, we need to wait for its power good indication so that we can. Um, go and enable the following uh, regulator in the power up sequence so the answer is all regulators not only the cdc's not only ldo's also charge pumps all types of regulators need to have a power good so that we know that we can move to the next in line of the power up sequence thank you very much uh we had here also aristide kuda Thank you, Professor, for this introduction. My question is to know what is the range of input voltage of PMU applicable in your case? Ah, very good. Well, it, of course, that it, it let's say I, I would say that the most common, most common, uh, most common power management units now are designed for lithium ion, ion, uh, ion batteries. So it means that they can go up to to 4.5 to 5 volts actually so it's 4.5 volt transistors most of the technology nowadays they have uh, um, ld mos and or somehow they have transistors that support up to 4.5 volts that we plus 10 percent goes to 5 volts um, that's the most normal normal case of course that there are when i talked about otp memory we have some power management units that also can um, include OTP, meaning that the one-time programming memory is included in the power management unit so that we can read data from the OTP. And in that case, uh, the, su the supply, well, at least one pin of the OTP needs to go to up to 12 volts, but the, the, the system itself operates up to five volts. That's the most normal, normal PMUs nowadays for specific applications we can have different voltage ranges if the technology allows for instance we have are now designing 
PMUs for um, magnetic resonance systems where the, the supply is uh, distributed at 12 volts. So it means that we need to use TSMC BCD technology to, to be capable of handling uh, to, to, to support 12 volts. The, the most typical PMUs nowadays are designed for 5 volt transistors, yes. Okay, so uh, I received good. Thank you for the question. And uh, well, I do have some some questions of my own since we don't have uh, uh, here on, on the chat, right? Uh, well, uh, well, we have another one. So let's let's start with this other yeah. one before yeah. before mine. So, how is a synchronous digital logic mapped? from uh, RTL code to transistor oh, level? So, so very, 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 very good question. Very good, very good question. That's fantastic. Um, a synchronous logic, it's uh, really challenging, you know. Uh, of course, you know that that's why you asked. Um, well, uh, to be honest, we have um, something that I didn't mention during this presentation. Um, most of these cores inside PMUs, they have evolved a uh, long time, but we, we don't need to design them from scratch uh, from scratch before because they are somehow reused uh, from one project to the other, to the other. We can do some porting and uh, do some improvements and so on. And uh, it, this means that uh, this uh, asynchronous logic uh, that is required for the RTC it is has been designed in incrementally a long time. And uh, the, the way it has been designed, uh, it has been designed manually. When I say manually, it's like Petri nets. I don't know if you are familiar with Petri nets. It's like one hot that goes through the state machine and it's designed manually. So we have a, uh, when we have a state diagram, um, we, we can define the conditions to. So my answer to your question is that we don't go from RTL design to 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 obtain logic in uh, designed asynchronously. We go from uh, a state diagram and then we design it as a Petri net. And uh, there are special tools for that. Um, WorkCraft, for instance, WorkCraft is one uh, open source tool that allows you to 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 go from from one specified state machine, and it does the synthesis um, very in a very good way. Uh, let's say um, uh, race-free synthesis from a specification of a given behavior uh, to an asynchronous state machine. So what I'm saying is there are tools for that, like WorkCraft. We are not using them yet. We plan to use it. For instance, in uh, this year, this CIS conference, we are submitting a paper exactly on this topic. <laughs> I expected that it will be accepted. And uh, so what we do right now, it's like we design Petri nets based on the state um, state graph, the, the state machine that we need to implement, and based on experience by our experience from pre previous projects, we know how to do it, let's say, uh, race free, but uh, the best way to do it, uh, if you go into design, I would say that is to get familiar with WorkCraft, that is uh, free, open source, and it enables you to enter um, a, a specification of a behavior you want to implement as a, in a synchronous circuit, and you you can do the the synthesis uh, in a, a fail safe. Um, wait. Well, that that was been indeed a very good question, right? It yeah, was very, uh, very good. Very good. It's, it's very 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 good because because it's, uh, using a clock in in an RTC it would kill completely the the efficiency. The it, it will rise the power consumption would rise dramatically because a clock needs to be there permanently, independent of being needed or not. If the system does not need to change state, but the clock is continuous there, so it's just wasting energy. So a synchronous design is the way to go. 
But the synchronous design, of course, it's prone to, to have races and to, to all the, the mistakes that can be made, uh, we can pay them with high price. So there is a, it's very good to have a, an approach, to have a methodology that, that can be safe and, and ensure a, a, a result that is error free. And WorkCraft can produce that. I have, a, let's say it's a master student finishing his thesis. Uh, working on this, and I'm really convinced that we are going to to now choose this this path. So, in the uh, to 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 uh, complement or to go on in this direction, uh, when when you say we have uh, the RTC with uh, 100 nano amps, you mean that we are just counting the clock? Yes. And all the logic is, is done asynchronously uh, according to the counted numbers. And, and, and the logic that is working asynchronously is just a, a ripple counter. Imagine, it, instead of having a counter, instead of having, I need to count those periods of the 32 kilohertz clock, I need to count in 15-bit counter to get one second uh, mm -hmm. clock. And this must be a, a ripple counter so that, uh, of course, all the, the bits don't change simultaneously, but I don't care. I just want to have the one second counting to increment the, the timekeeping register, uh, the timekeeping counter of 32 bits, which is also a ripple counter. This, this forces us to have some solutions, for instance. you can One, one of the difficulties that you can imagine is I can go through uh, intermediate states when I have a ripple counter. So if I'm comparing with an alarm, I can have false comparisons. If I'm comparing a, a, a counter that is a ripple counter with a constant value in an alarm register, it can go, it can have exhibit the, the exact same value just for a fraction of, <laughs> of the period. But I can deal with that, for instance, using opposite edges of the clock, meaning that I only sample the clock equal to alarm. I only sample that information in the opposite uh, clock edge that I use to increment the time. So uh, I'm sure that I have 15 microseconds, which is half the period of the 32 kilohertz clock. I have 15 microseconds to... Uh, go to a steady state in my ripple counter and that's more than enough so we need when when designing the synchronous circuits we need to use this type of uh, thinking of that temporary information must be misleading we need to ignore temporary information and only rely uh, only, only sample when everything is steady state very good very good thank you very much uh my Just uh, uh, to conclude that uh, uh, very interesting talk, uh, you said about the, the uh, digital models, but they are just uh, for show. I would say that all the startup uh, and uh, and the validation of the circuit that can be very complex depending on the on the size, right, is done in analog. The, the, the validation is done in analog for uh, analog blocks and oh, yeah, let's say um, all the blocks individually, let's say each regulator, the APC, the, each block of the RTC and the complete RTC, they are validated at transistor level uh, with analog mm -hmm. simulation. But it is very important to, to simulate everything together because everything together, it's where you find issues at system level and they they need to be validated uh, now we are starting to work with uvm to perform a much more complete uh, validation uh, of our models but so far what we do is that we we model um even in verilog we are able to model not only the digital behavior but also the analog behavior that is relevant in a way that when we put the whole power management unit together, we can simulate the complete power management unit in a digital Verilog simulator, but still see 
all the analog signals with with, with detail they need to be analyzed uh, like mm -hmm. here uh, uh, and, and and this is very important not only for validating the PMU itself by us uh, but also to deliver to a customer that is going to make the integration of this PMU in a system and is able to use a very log simulator a digital very log simulator to simulate its its system but already with the PMU and the PMU has analog behavior but is simulated by a digital simulator so this is really important and especially because of something that I didn't mention that is the the topology of all blocks in the very log model is obtained directly uh, as an extraction from the, the the schematics that we design in in cadence virtual so let's say that the analog blocks all the structure of each LDO the structure of the ATC the structure of the RTC I don't create a model based on my opinion of what will be the behavior I the model is created automatically by extraction of the net list of the schematic of the design we only need to model by hand small analog functions so this gives us a, a high degree of confidence that what we are simulating at system level actually will be what we find when we get the silicon mm -hmm. very interesting very interesting so uh, uh just just to to <laughs> Uh, th this this will, will go forever so so i will try to, to stop myself right yeah. uh, but uh, just one last question so the mini you you are doing uh, uh, uh verification from an analog point of view using uh real numbers that's basically yeah. you are doing yes 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 very good we, we, very we are good. we are doing in a digital very long what you can see here in, I'm, I'm not sure if you are seeing the the slide that i'm displaying are you yeah 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 you I, are I, I, so so you can see the the power of sequence but then you can see something in place that when we mm -hmm. release the par z when we, we release the reset and we also release the, the 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 interface you see that voltages are adjusting voltages are changing why yeah. are why are voltages changing here? It's because since we released the, the interface, so the disable level converters was released, the digital values that the digital logic is programming the regu regulator. So this is this was the default value of the regulator. So it, it ramped up to the default value of the regulator. But after we released the interface, you see the voltage going to the value that it, it was programmed. So we can check. The, the voltage value that where where we were programming and if we change the program the the the, 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 the digital values that control the, the output voltage of the regulator we will see this adapting so this is the level of detail that this uh, model has well uh, let's say that uh, uh, formal analog verification is a dream right <laughs> trying to get there so it's yeah. a very, very good stop i say very good step uh we have another last question here from lr which is uh if this uh excelium that you're using excelium excelium use one of the digital uh tools uh cadences uh, uh, we 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 use vcs um Mainly VCS, yes. We use VCS. We use um, NC Vlog, yeah. Uh, NC Sim. We we, we yeah, yeah. From, from from Synopsis and Cadence mainly. Mainly those are uh, okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a great talk, uh, and uh, uh, for the people that uh, stay at this long, right? I mean, the, the 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 questions were really nice, really nice, really enlightening, enlightening. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, Thank you. It was very good to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you. Bye bye, everybody. So next week uh, we come back.